I'm pleased to be joined by Eric Goldstein, Senior Attorney and the New York Urban Program Director for the Natural Resources Defense Council. NRDC is a nonprofit environmental organization that calls itself the Earth's Best Defense. Welcome to Citywide. Thank you, Ken. Well, Eric, everybody seems to be talking about the weather, but what are you doing about it? Well, obviously, for a national environmental group like NRDC, global warming is problem number one. And in a nutshell, as you know, the uh, Earth is, temperature is warmer now than at any time it's been in our history. Uh, the polar ice caps are melting, the polar bears are endangered, and maybe in our children's lifetime they'll disappear. The weather patterns are shifting, we're having more significant tornadoes, and, and um, there are a whole host of impacts globally in the United States, and even here in New York City, where our beaches are endangered, our airports, our highways. Uh, and so the impacts are real. We know it's here now. The good news is that there's plenty that can be done about it, and NRDC has as its primary objective uh, finding solutions at the international level, national level, and locally. Tell us a little bit about what the organization is and how you function, and we want to, I want to talk about some of the specific initiatives that you have. Sure. NRDC is, as I indicated, a national environmental group. We were founded in 1970 right here in New York City at the birth of the modern environmental era, the first Earth Day, April 22nd, 1970. That was just about the time that NRDC got rolling. We started off as a law firm helping to write the nation's environmental laws and rules and regulations. Uh, we have expanded since then into science, economics, wide-ranging advocacy and think tank activities. Today we have uh, over 1.2 million members and email activists. We have offices five throughout the United States and a major new operation in Beijing, China. And uh, we are active on a whole host of issues, both locally in places like New York City, regionally, nationally, and internationally. How do you determine what your priorities are and whether you should be pursuing the, the, the science of an issue or the regulation of an issue? Well, uh, our priorities are set by our board of directors and our staff. Many of our staff people have been active on these issue areas for 10, 15, or 20 years. Uh, we still litigate as a portion of our work. We get suggestions for cases from our membership and from citizens and citizen groups around the country. Uh, the foundations that contribute uh, to us and are part of our funding, obviously we work with them in shaping our agenda. Um, but it is really uh, based upon the most pressing and compelling issues. We are a solution-oriented organization. So uh, through a variety of mechanisms, we identify the most pressing environmental problems facing the city, the state, the nation, and the planet, and develop long-term programs to address them. So you've referenced uh, cases or litigation a couple of times. Is the, what are the principal tools that you use for influencing policy? It's easy to uh, describe us as a law, science, economics organization, but perhaps the uh, shorthand version is we conduct campaigns. Uh, and with campaign tactics, it's, it's a bit of whatever works. Uh, we often start off by doing policy analysis and gathering experts, uh, identifying the most pressing facts on an issue. Uh, then we organize coalitions because it's very uh, difficult to change public policy without working in broad groups, public uh, officials, uh, local community groups. Uh, in some cases, we work with uh, consumer groups, in some cases with business groups. And so we build broad coalitions after we've gotten the facts together. And then it's a question of uh, what's the most effective way of change? Is it um, rewriting the laws? Is it setting some model economic policies? Is it working with the business to develop the cutting edge leadership? Is it litigating? Uh, all of those tools are available to us. And one of the things that characterizes NRDC is our willingness to use all of the tools in the toolbox, from citizen action to working with uh, businesses where uh, they are interested in taking enlightened positions and not simply greenwashing, to working with Congress or the state legislatures, the laboratories of democracy. What do you mean by greenwashing? 
Well, obviously these days uh, the environment uh, is a top flight issue and uh, many in all segments of society are interested in responding to the legitimate consumer and public demands that we protect our environment, that we clean our air, that we provide safe drinking water. Or at least to give the appearance that that's what they're interested in. And that's the question. And some, and so the business community has gotten on this bandwagon. And some of our uh, enlightened business leaders are truly at the cutting edge, recognize the economic opportunities in uh, steering their companies and corporations into environmentally sensitive directions. And, and others may just be interested in having the appearance. And so greenwashing uh, is, is, is sort of having the patina, the appearance of moving in that direction without making the necessary changes to make our planet livable for our children and their children. I'm struck by something that you said. NRDC founded um, with the birth of the environmental movement, Earth Day, 1970. Uh, at that point in time, uh, a lot of attention on the environment, uh, uh, pesticides, uh, power plants. Um, Congress and state legislatures respond by enacting a whole regulatory framework that hadn't um, existed. And then it kind of institutionalized the issues. In other words, the, the, the parameters of the field of, of, of policy discourse were, were somewhat set. Continued on for a generation with um, some issues uh, popping up uh, now and then, but basically largely fading from a concern of, of voters because there was no imminent threat. Uh, people weren't going to be dying from smog. Uh, uh, the water was basically getting uh, getting cleaner. Now with, um, with the attention on global warming, which itself has taken 10 years to, to get onto the public agenda, uh, the work that former Vice President Gore has done to, uh, to raise the visibility of it, um, it, it seems like everybody's talking about it, and as I say, everybody's talking about the weather, but is it clear that we're going to be able to sustain public interest in this and political will um, since the steps that need to be taken are um, complicated and may require years to implement? Um, it's not that you can simply say yes or no to one thing and have the problem go away. So will we be in a situation where 5, 10, 15 years from now, uh, people's recollection of this era has, has faded, and, but the issue hasn't gone away? Well, first, let me say, and I thought that was like an excellent synopsis of 38 years of environmental history. Um, and you're asking me to predict the future, and of course Yogi Berra says it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, but I will say this, government has responded uh, in, the, in t times of crisis. That's been the history of environmental control and environmental change. If there are oil spills off the Santa Barbara coast, uh, the government reacts. We have the Exxon Valdez spill, government reacts. Three Mile Island, all of these uh, crises have been uh, one of the drivers in bringing about environmental change. And certainly with global warming, uh, the National Academy of Sciences, thousands of scientists around the country and the world have indicated that these changes are coming. And in fact, um, they are coming at a very rapid pace. We've gotten maybe a decade or two to turn things around. So it will be inevitable that we adjust to them and address them. Now. Uh, how, how much that will stay in the public mind, uh, no one knows, although right now the public certainly seems concerned, and when you've got rapid change coming with things like oil shocks and $4.50 gasoline, change could come very rapidly. Who would have known even a year ago that everyone would be wanting to get rid of their SUVs or at least drive them a lot less because of gasoline prices? And the public seems to have connected those two issues together. You know, in other words, the, 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 the spike in oil, um, people becoming more conservation-minded at the same time um, that uh, the vice president and others are saying people have to reduce their individual impact on the on the earth. Are the are the two issues really connected? Well, they are connected uh, because as uh, the environmental grandfather Barry Commoner, a professor at Queens College now, once said, everything is connected to everything else. That's the first law of ecology, and these are connected uh, and. Um, Ultimately, the environmental problems also provide economic opportunities. 
and uh, environmental control and protection would have been a lot easier if the true costs of activities and business had been factored in uh, to um, the, the price of products and activities earlier on. Now, as economists call this, internalizing the externalities. So it means if the actual environmental costs of driving uh, are such that um, gasoline needs to be priced more highly or the worldwide demand uh, is increasing and the costs of gasoline are rising accordingly, that's an economic incentive that reflects the real world scarcity of oil. So separate and apart from the environmental impacts of burning fossil fuels at the rate we've been going, uh, the economics as they fit into the piece of the puzzle will also drive the nation in a more conservation oriented way. And New York City benefits from those kinds of changes. We're going to continue this conversation and, and talk about some of the impacts of the environment on New York and New York on the environment when Citywide continues right after this. Big dreams and good grades aren't enough to get into college. There are actual steps you need to take. Finding someone who can help is the first and most important. For the next steps, go to knowhowtogo.org. Welcome back to Citywide. We're speaking with Eric Goldstein, senior attorney at NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. Before the break, we were talking a little bit about the connection that consumers have made with um, uh, energy costs and their individual impact on the environment. But it seems to me that one of the most difficult things for, for consumers, for ordinary people today, is to figure out what they can do that's actually meaningful and to think through the consequences of their actions. For example, um, it sounds great to be able to buy an electric car because, after all, you're not going to be polluting the atmosphere where, where you live. On the other hand, if the electricity from that car is generated by a coal power plant um, that's uh, out of sight and out of mind, uh, you may not actually be doing anything to improve the environment. How do, how do individual consumers make the right choices? Well, you've asked another solid question. Uh, NRDC commissioned the McKenzie Group, that's the uh, international consulting firm, to take a look at issues like global warming and tell us how we could rank the various solutions. And what they, after a year study, came back and said, the good news was that the solutions to global warming are available today, on the shelf today. What we need is the leadership and the political will to implement them. So consumers can do a couple of things. One thing they can do is make wise purchasing decisions. Uh, and that involves, in the most broad sense, buying long, more durable products, buying what they need. And in terms of automobiles, hybrids are available right now. Uh, of course, the best uh, and a second thing that consumers could do is where they choose not only what to buy, but where they choose to live in their lifestyles or a second major influencer. So you've got the transportation system and you've got buildings, two major causes or emitters of global warming pollution. And so city living, compact living patterns, uh, use 30 percent less energy than do uh, suburban style developments. Uh, they produce less air pollution because people use transit more. They consume less water. And so it may seem counterintuitive, but cities are great for the environment. And so by choosing to live in a city or in a compact, uh, older suburb as such, uh, consumers can have a major impact on a wide variety of, of environmental concerns. You know, it is counterintuitive because the... I guess the traditional notion was that the quality of life in the suburbs uh, was so good you could play in the backyard. Um, what are some of the things that New York City needs to do to improve the quality of life, um, given the fact that its population is growing so rapidly and likely to continue as people wake up to the fact that cities are better for the environment? Well, the most important thing the city could do is plan for the long term. Uh, we need to protect our infrastructure whether that's the transit system infrastructure and invest in it. We need to protect our 19 upstate reservoirs, our water supply, and protect them and protect the lands around them. 
and we need to make the city, the quality of life here, livable so that people who have the economic uh, funds to decide where they want to live would choose to live in cities. And so that means everything from planting trees, as Mayor Bloomberg and his Plan YC is intending to do, to uh, increasing park space and making parks available to every New Yorker, uh, to making sure that our transit system runs efficiently and cleanly, to dealing with the congestion problem. So there are a wide host of things that we can do to make cities livable. Um, but the good news is that the city's population is increasing and people are continuing to be attracted to New York and other cities around the nation. Uh, those trends are likely to continue over the next decade or two, but they'll take work from our elected officials. And so to circle back to your last question, the third thing that folks could do uh, who are concerned about preserving the environment, the first being make smart purchasing choices, the second uh, live in lifestyles and locations that are compatible with environmental protection. The third is to get involved in the political process, because only when elected officials hear from members of the public about their desires for more green space and cleaner air and uh, safe drinking water, uh, are they likely to put those issues uh, high on the priority list? Yeah, I think it was Thomas Friedman in the New York Times who said you can change your light bulbs or you can change your elected officials. Um, a city as large and uh, dense as New York has its own uh, special environmental challenges. You mentioned the, the water system. One of them is providing the energy uh, that it takes to, uh, to run a city like New York. Um, the siting of power plants within city limits is near to impossible. On the other hand, people outside the city don't want the intrusions that they represent. And the other is the disposal of waste. I mean, it's the, the you know, I guess probably the biggest tangible product of the city of New York is waste, whether it's paper garbage or, uh, or, or sewage. How does a city like New York even begin to, 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 to tackle those kinds of issues? On the issue of energy, uh, the, the simple word is conservation. There is, despite the fact that we're much more energy efficient than our r rural and suburban neighbors, uh, there is still a long way that New York City and New York State could go in terms of conserving the uh, amount of energy that we use. And one very simple example, we've been called by a lot of our members uh, in the last couple of summers as they walk down the streets on Fifth Avenue or Broadway, and they are uh, engulfed by these cold Arctic blasts of wind from open doors uh, at retail stores. And um, they've asked us if we could do something about that. It seems to be an incredible waste of energy. We looked into the issue, and lo and behold, the Long Island Power Authority says that commercial establishments that leave their doors open with air conditioners blasting in the heat of summer are consuming an extra 20 to 25 percent of their electricity. And that's not only a wasteful practice, but it could lead to city brownouts and all, because obviously this conduct is happening on the hottest days of the summer. Uh, and so there's now legislation in the city council introduced by Congresswoman, uh, by Councilwoman Gail Brewer, that would address that issue. But, but, but let, let's take that, because I think that's a great example. Is the solution there to forbid it, or is it the market that as energy uh, goes up and up, uh, those businesses will choose <clears throat> not, to, uh, uh, not to be profligate in that way? I mean, I don't hear anyone suggesting that that same store should be told to turn out the lights um, in their display windows if they think that an open door and cool air conditioning is going to bring customers in and it's worthwhile to them. Why shouldn't they be allowed to do it? And if they think that it's too expensive to, to do that, they'll close the door. Well, that's a fair question. And if we could get the pricing structure right so that on the hottest days of the year when the energy demand was highest, uh, large commercial establishments were charged more for um, their energy so that they would create an economic incentive, we wouldn't need the legislation. Uh, NRDC has no particular uh, favorite way of solving the problem, but right now with the energy price structure the way it is, there is no economic incentive, uh, even on the hottest days of the year, for those commercial establishments to figure out ways of saving. Uh, in this instance, uh, legislation on this particular front uh, is to us one appropriate mechanism, and that's because it's not simply that store or the store's consumers that are paying the price. If that excess of energy turns up causing a brownout, then we all suffer. Historically, I think there have been two 
um, or maybe three branches of, of the uh, environmental movement. Um, I'd call them trees and toxics. Uh, not to diminish the significance of them, but there was the conservation movement, which was about protecting um, open space, protecting uh, uh, water bodies and the like. And then there was the uh, movement that was against pollution, whether it was in the form of a individual uh, power plant or sewage treatment plant or incinerator, or um, in the form of uh, uh, discharges into, into public waterways. There seems to be an emerging third group now, which, which is a, about climate change. It's about the, the overall um, sustainability, if you will, of, uh, of cities and, and other uh, systems. But uh, how deep has that taken hold with policymakers? You know, something the mayor talks about. How deep has it taken hold, and um, how much of what individual voters and others are looking at is just on the surface? It's hard to assess how deep it is, but within the environmental movement, it is a very strong frame. And so the environmental movement at the start of the 20th century was largely a conservation-based movement. Then there was an urban public health strand and labor protection strand, because workers are often the first to suffer from environmental insults. Those two strands came together, gave birth to the modern environmental movement, and now recognizing that sustainability, can we provide the resources for the planet to sustain itself and for our children and their children to have sufficient resources, that's an overall framework for the whole movement. Uh, New York City seems to have adopted that approach. Which that's Mayor Bloomberg's philosophy in their plan. Uh, City Council Speaker Christine Quinn has been following that approach, and so uh, it, it has an appeal to people, and we want to be safe on the streets. We want to have good education for our kids in the city. We want to have decent parks and places to play, and we want to have clean air and clean water, and we shouldn't have to choose between or among all of those. And, and there also seems to be an opportunity for jobs in that, um, the, for economic growth in New York, because if you're recycling building materials, if there's a premium for locally manufactured goods, um, is there an opportunity to create a green environment, a green economic base in the city and, and green jobs? Many of the folks who are looking at these issues think that the environment is the best economic engine for the United States in the 21st century. And we can only look to the VC paper mill in Staten Island. New Yorkers are being pretty good about recycling our newspapers and uh, our magazines. Most of those papers and magazines are picked up now. They're taken over to a mill in Staten Island that employs several hundred workers that's turning that paper into a new paper. And there are opportunities to do that in all aspects of recycling, whether it be plastics or textiles. Uh, and so, yes, the environment is about jobs creation. And on the energy front as well, we think there are a lot of jobs that can come out of the solution to the global warming problem. My thanks to Eric Goldstein, senior attorney and the New York Urban Program Director for NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. I'm Ken Fisher. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Citywide.